It's, uh, it's awesome having the Ivies. Uh, I've known Rachel ever since she was, I guess, in second grade, and um, uh, have a lot of respect for her parents and for her family. And a few months ago, we actually, her dad stayed with us for a week, and I got a chance to kind of just sit with him for hours and pick his brain and kind of get knowledge and wisdom from him, and, and uh, he's just a, an awesome, awesome man. Uh, we got some seats up here in the middle in the front, if you guys like the front. <laughs> Sorry about that. I hate front seats, uh, but uh, people are, if I, if, if I was just chilling at a church, I'd be in the back row. That, that's just me. Love it. Um, they call that the Isle of Denial. Sorry for you guys in the back. <laughs> oh, anyway, Christine and I went to uh, uh, Aruba, and we got back last Saturday, and it was really nice to get away, and to be honest with you, I learned a couple of things. The first thing I learned is that it's important to get away and refuel. It really is. And if you're in a situation where you're trying to pour into people, uh, it's hard to pour into people if you're empty. You know what I mean? And you got to fill up in order to pour into people. And so I think it's really important to kind of get away and refuel and get some rest and um, kind of chill out. Uh, it's just an important thing to do. Uh, you need rest, you need vacation, you need to read, you need to get into God's Word, you need to get on your knees and pray, and just kind of fill up again. Another thing, too, is, you know, we all have a lot of close relationships. We have husbands, wives, we have kids, and whatever. And you're going to find that it's really hard to be effective at what you're doing if you're stressing about some of the closest relationships that you have, you know? I mean, if you're really struggling, it's tough to be effective, it's tough to be effective, and so you get away and you work on those, those things. And what I wanted to do was, to be honest with you, it was, the trip for me was all about royalty, is what I say, because I wanted to work on my relationship with my king and my queen, all right? My king is Jesus, and my queen is Christine. And so, to be honest with you, the three of us had a blast. We really did, <laughs> all three of us, me, Christine, and Jesus. And, uh, you know, again, it's just really, it's really, really important to do. Um, Christine and I just got to spend time together. We held hands, lots of hand holding <laughs> as we're walking down the street, you know, whatever. Um, we actually got to, uh, you know, just talk and spend a lot of time together. And uh, we got a chance to have a lot of romantic dinners in Aruba. You got to trill the R, Aruba, all right? And, um, and it was kind of nice because... Several of their restaurants are literally on the beach. And so we'd be sitting on the beach at about 6.30 watching the sun just drop into the Caribbean Sea. And it was just beautiful, and, you know, to be able to do that. And I think it really strengthened our relationship. And, I, and, you know, Jesus said to the disciples, he said, you know what, you guys need to just chill. You need to get some rest. It's important to do that. And he said that you need to come apart. You need to go to a desert place. You need to rest because you've been going nonstop, and it's important for you to do that. I looked inside your programs are some notes if you want to pull those out. If you have your Bibles, open up to Mark chapter 6 and verse 31. I've got it up here on the screen. I'm looking at it in the King James, and basically what he says is, he says to the disciples, come apart, go to a desert place, get some rest. Lots of people are coming and going. We haven't even had time even to eat and so, I mean, you know you're busy if you don't even have time to eat. That's pretty busy. And so what does Jesus say to do? He says, come apart. Basically, what Jesus is saying is this. He says, if you don't come apart, you're going to come apart. If you don't get away and rest and start filling up, you're never going to be able to pour into anybody else. I knew a guy who used to brag all the time. He used to say, I'd never take a vacation. And as a young pastor, I always used to sit back and go, oh, that dude is so awesome. He's so committed. I wish I was as committed as he was. You know what? His marriage is still together, but his family has really fallen apart. And I, I tell you, you got to get to the place in your life, in your ministry, where you sit back and you say, hey, you know what? I'm not willing to do that. I'm not willing to let everything fall apart. I'm not willing to let my marriage fall apart. I'm not willing to let my family fall apart. You know, I'm not going to sacrifice my marriage on the altar of my success or, or, or everybody else's opinion of me to think that I'm so you know, committed, and I'm so down with everything, when the fact of the matter is we have a responsibility, you know, to our family. And, um, you know, so it's just important to do. And, you know, can I say something that's going to sound mean? This is going to sound bad. I'm just as a disclaimer. I'm like Captain Disclaimer all the time, and I apologize for that. And there's another disclaimer, right? 
Um, discla- I have disclaimers for disclaimers. That's bad. But anyway, here's the deal. Um, if you ever have like, this is a dumb illustration, and I just thought of it because it's so it's dumb. Another disclaimer. So I take, I, let's say you take a, a bottle of barbecue sauce, and you're, you're, you, you take that bar- bottle of barbecue sauce, and you love it, and you fill your plate up with barbecue sauce, and you're pounding down your chicken, and you love it, man. It's, it's sweet baby rays or whatever you eat, right? And, um, and you, you take that, and you put it back in the fridge, and you go, until next time, you know, until I need you, right? And then all of a sudden, there comes a day when it's empty, and you're trying to get barbecue sauce out of it, and you're looking at it like, come on, we're can-? and it's making weird noises as you squeeze it and try to get it out, and everybody's like, oh, that's gross, just throw it away. So you take it, and you, you say, you know what, I'm done with you, and it's empty, and you throw it away. And what do you do? You buy a new bottle. And you get that new bottle and go, oh, you're my new bottle of barbecue. Can't wait till I'll have chicken again or whatever. I'm going to tell you, it's not, it's, it, that's kind of a weird illustration. But the truth of the matter is I think sometimes people in life kind of look at you that way, like in your business or in your, where you work or in your circle. And people say as long as they can get something out of you, they'll keep you around. They'll, you, they'll have you and they'll keep you there. But when you're empty... They'll be quick. And, and not that they're wanting to hate you or despise you. And I know it's a bad illustration. And it sounds rough. But I'll tell you something. Your company will be quick to kick you to the curb when you don't have anything else to give, you know. And so you need to sit back and say, I need to make sure that I fill myself up. And I need to make sure that I am there for my wife because she'll always be there. Your husband will always be there. When they give you the gold watch and kick you out of your office, your, your wife's going to be at the, in the car waiting for you. Come on, honey, let's go home, right? And you're going to go, I thought I was like indispensable. <laughs> and you're going to sit in the passenger side and cry all the way home. But your, your wife or husband is going to be right there. They're not going to throw you out because you're out of barbecue sauce, you know? S- silly illustration. I didn't even say it last night, but I just thought of it this morning. <laughs> the second thing I learned is this. Somebody's always watching you no matter where you go. How many of you ever heard this? You've heard this before. It says, character is who you are when nobody's watching. Have you ever heard that? Anybody ever heard that? You know, I believe it's true. But let me say this. Somebody is always watching you. Always. You know, even if it's just God, and I hate saying just God because that's the most important person that watches us. But trust me, God is always watching you. And I saw this verse in Psalm 33, 13. It says, the Lord looks down from heaven and he sees the whole human race. From his throne, he observes all who live on the earth. Trust me, God is always watching. And he's the most important audience. Because one day, you're not going to stand before me. You're not going to stand before your neighbor. You're going to stand before God. And he is the one that watches you all the time. And so it's important that we live a life of character because his eyes are watching us. But not only that, it's kind of interesting. We were sitting in a restaurant in Aruba. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, I hear this. Pastor Barry? I turn around, and it's a lady named Lisa. Is Lisa here today, by the way? I don't know if she's here. She's still in Aruba. No, she's not, because I saw her on the airplane coming back. (laughs) She was everywhere. (laughs) So literally, literally, she goes, I go to Park Valley. And I'm like, that's great. So after she, she leaves our table, she goes, I was over there watching you for the longest time, and I just wanted to come up and say, are you Pastor Barry? And, you know, I'm thinking to myself, I, I say this to Christine. I say, boy, it's a good thing we weren't doing anything bad. <laughs> I like that. And then Christine's like, what do you mean bad? What will we do, be doing bad? What do you mean bad? And I'm like, I'm just saying. I'm not saying we do something bad. The bottom line is, Trust me, somebody is going to be watching you, right? And so I got to the place where I started to think, literally, just about that whole context, about the trip and somebody watching us and character. And I thought to myself, I don't want to live the kind of life that says, I want to do right because people are watching. You know what? I want to do right because I love Jesus. That's why I want to do right. And I always get choked up by that because it's just so real. You know, he has literally done everything for me. He dies on a cross for me. 
And you know what? Whoever watches, watches. Whatever, blah, blah, blah. The bottom line is, I love Jesus Christ, and he's done everything for me, so I want to do what's right because it pleases him. You know, and I've given my life to him. The other day, we have a family in our church that's getting a house from Habitat from Humanity. And the, the woman, a single mom, two precious kids, called me and said, would you come out? We're going to have a little a blessing for the start of the construction. Would you please come out and speak and pray and all that stuff? And I said, absolutely. And I thought, I've never done anything like that before. So I got in the car, went over there. Me and Jeff Redabaugh went over there uh, early yesterday morning. And there was like 45, 50 people there. And I'm going, man, this is like a big deal. And I remember getting up and I remember saying, you know what? I have no other choice but to tell you about Jesus. I got to tell everybody about him because he died on a cross for me. Shed his blood for me. I got no other choice but to give my life to him, right? I mean, he gave his life for me. And so I remember telling all those people about Christ and you could see people going like this. Mm -hmm, yep. <laughs> and they were tracking and they were identifying. And so it's just important that we understand why we live the way we live. And so... Today is just a, a brief, random thought message from me about what do we value as a church? Park Valley Church, what do we value as a church? And how what we value as a church is directly linked to the fact of whether or not somebody who walks through the doors of this church will ever experience life change. People will experience life change as they walk through the doors of this church if and only if we as a church value what we need to value. Because values and life change are always connected. You say, how do you know that? Because if you really want to change in your life, you change what you value. If you change what you value, you will change. You absolutely, positively will change. It's going to happen in your life. I love the way Disney works a lot of times because they have an incredible business model. It's a very simple thing. Make people happy. That's our mission. And everything that they do, it, it bleeds literally into everything that they do, whether it's a concession stand, whether it's a line for a ride, which doesn't make you happy a lot of times, whether it's a ride itself, whether it's their bathrooms. They want you to go into their bathroom, walk out of their bathroom and go, I love that bathroom. I'm so happy, you know. <laughs> they want you to be happy with everything that you, I'm going back in the bathroom. I just want to spend some time in there. You know, they just want everything to make you happy. You know what? We as a church have a very simple mission. Our mission is to see people's lives changed forever. That's it. Our mission is for people's lives to change and for them to make the decision. You know what I want to be? I want to be a committed follower of Jesus. I want to follow Jesus I want to give my life to him and imitate him and follow him and not do what I want to do anymore, but do what he wants me to do. And it's a huge commitment and it's a huge decision and it's a life change. But we want to value the right things as a church so that people's lives will change. Everything that we do here, it's all about life change. We want life changing donuts, right? We want life changing coffee. We want life changing greeters. We want life changing ministries like children's ministries and I was just out talking to one of the security guys out front. He goes, Barry, I have never seen so many kids pack this lobby in the, this morning. And there's kids everywhere. They're coming out of the woodwork, you know. You know why? Because we want life-changing children's ministries. We want kids to wake up on Sunday morning and go, church rocks. We want to be there. You know, I want to be with my class. We want their lives to change. You got to get them when they're young, right? And teach them about Jesus. And so it's important. We want life-changing small groups and men's and women's ministries. And we want life-changing missions and discipleship and outreach. And, and there's just a long list. But we want this church, we want to be a church that Jesus uses to change people's lives. And it doesn't mean that everybody's going to be happy with PVC. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to come here and say, I'm going to join. You know, It doesn't mean that. Sometimes this church isn't for everyone. And personally, my personal opinion is that it is. It's for everyone. I think everybody ought to come, you know. The whole city ought to be in this church. I, if we had 15 services, we'd do it somehow. I wouldn't have a voice, but whatever. The bottom line is we want to reach this city for Jesus. And, and our whole goal is it's just for people's lives to be changed, for people to be loved and for their lives to be changed. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're frustrated because you can't, you're trying to change and you just can't change. Or maybe you're praying for somebody. You're praying, dear Heavenly Father, please change my husband. Please, I'm begging you, God. You know, change him. 
you know, or whatever. I don't know what it is that you're, that you're going through. But you know what? Real change is possible. Real change with Jesus is absolutely possible. And when we change our values, we will have change. Rick Warren has said so many times, every organization has a culture. Whether it's a business, a family, a church, an individual, everybody has a, cul- uh, has a culture. That culture is determined by what we value. And the values determine the, our vision, our direction, our results, what we do, how we do, how we interact as a family, as a church family. Our values determine all that. That's how huge it is. That's how important it is. Your values are so important because your values are you. Now, there's three things that cha- tend to change our values really fast. Number one, pain changes us. How many of you believe that? Raise your hand. Pain's a great motivator. <laughs> pain has a way of changing our values. It just does. You know, we can have pain in our life, and all of a sudden, when the level of pain uh, starts to outweigh our fear, then we'll change eventually. I told you the story about a year ago when I was a kid, and there was a bully that used to pick on me, and he picked on me at church. And so I didn't want to go to church because this guy was going to, you know, punch me and kick me and call me names and spit on me. I mean, it was bad. It was a bad situation. And uh, I was scared to death of the kid. His name was Walter Stoll, and I was scared of him. And I know the guy's name. Hey, I, I will say this, and I'm not happy about this, but he has since written me from prison. I'm not happy about it. Not happy about it. All right? Uh, but anyway. So, you know... Uh, seemed like our class was always the farthest away from population, you know, and, and they never turned the lights on. And, you know, I don't know if that was just all in my head. It was, it was just a dark, dark time. But um, I remember one time, you know, he had me into a corner and he was just punching me and saying all these, you know, wonderful, uplifting things. And, and, and all of a sudden, I don't know what happened to me, but I, I went psychotic. I went psycho. <laughs> I remember this story, if I told you about a year ago, if you're new, you're hearing it for the first time, but I just remember going, ah, ah, screaming and grabbing him by the shirt and just punching him as hard as I could. I saw this fear come over him that I, I didn't think he could do. He was afraid, actually, he was afraid of me. I didn't know that. And he fell down onto the ground, and of course, I didn't stop punching. I just kept punching him as hard as I could. And then until an adult grabbed me and pulled me off of him, and I think I was the one that ended up getting in trouble. But, um, you know, it's funny. I didn't have any more problems after that. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? And I think what happens is this. Sometimes you're, you, you're afraid, right? But what happens is your pain starts to become greater than your fear, and you, you learn how to have courage. You start to value courage, and you stand up for yourself, and you say, I'm not doing this anymore. And you go psycho, and your psychosis reveals his, the fact that he was just a punk. And, and anyway, again, it's therapy for me every weekend. <laughs> <sighs> Sometimes when we have loss in our life, it causes us to change our values. We've, we've talked about it before, but a doctor comes in and says, you know, I, I'm sorry to tell you you've got diabetes. Sorry to tell you you've had a heart attack. I'm sorry to tell you that was a mini stroke that you went through and you're in a bad situation. And all of a sudden, we, we value health. We say, we go, we talk to our loved one and we say, don't we have a treadmill in the house somewhere? I'm going to dust that puppy off. I'm going to start getting on that thing. I'm going to stop using it as a shelf and get on it and use it, you know. I remember one time I went to dinner with a guy and he was talking to the waiter and he kept saying, now, does the chef put butter in with the mix, with the recipe? And I'm, back, I'm going, just order the meal. What are you doing? You know, he's talking about salt. Then he brings out little containers of all his own little condiments. I'm like going, you bring your own condiments? And he looked at me and he said this. I had a massive heart attack. He said, if I don't do this, I'm going to die. And I said, oh, okay, it's cool. Go ahead and do it. But you know what? His values had changed because he had gone through loss. He had suffered loss when it came to his, to his health. Um, we, we, may, we may hate our jobs and lose our job, and then all of a sudden think, that wasn't such a bad job. I kind of wish I had that job. We may hate our living arrangements, just like the prodigal son. The prodigal son couldn't stand living with his father, couldn't stand living in his house, 
with the arrangements that he had. So he said, give me all my inheritance. I'm out of here. So he gave him his money. He left, went away to a foreign country, lived his life in sin, lost everything that he had. And then he ended up having to get a job. A famine came. He found out as a, as a young Jewish lad working in a pig farm, not a good combination. Now he's in a pig, literally working in a, in a pig farm. And he knew something was wrong when he started looking at the slop that the pigs were eating and his mouth started to water for the slop that they were eating. And he said, what's wrong with this picture? Isn't it amazing how pig slop can cause us to change our values? You know what he started to think? He started to think, well, my dad's not so bad. And my home's not so bad. And I think I'm going back home. Look in your notes, Luke 15, 17. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home even the hired men have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I'm going home. I'm going back to dad. Dad wasn't so bad. Home wasn't so bad. I'm just going to tell him, look, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant in your home. Changes our values. One of my favorite verses in the book of Jonah, and by the way, I believe that Jonah literally was in a fish for three days and three nights. Literally. He was fish bait, <laughs> literally. That has a way of changing your values, doesn't it? What happens? Jonah chapter 2 and verse 7, he disdained God. He ran away from God. But in 2, 7, he said, when I lost all hope, I turned my thoughts once more to the Lord. And my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Wow, God, I really think you're awesome. I think the job you wanted me to do, I'm down with that. I'll, I'll go do the job you want me to do. Because sometimes loss and pain changes how we changes what we value. Sometimes we pray, Lord, change someone. When we pray, Lord, change someone, we're asking, Lord, would you please give them some pain and loss? Because a lot of times, that's the only thing that really changes our values. Another thing, really quick, and it's not pain or loss, it's kind of a little bit different, but it's called thankfulness. And I was talking to a buddy of mine a little while ago, and we were talking about how both of us struggle with anger, anger issues, and being irritated with things. And we both kind of realized that, you know, when it all boils down, probably the antidote to anger is just to be thankful. I think that we become angry with the people in our lives that we take for granted. We start to take people for granted. And when we do that, we get all bent out of shape and we get angry and we get ticked off. And, and every once in a while, we need somebody to kind of slap us upside the face and say, wait, you're taking everybody for granted. Why don't you be thankful for what God's given you? It's like in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4, before Paul writes this harsh letter to the church at Corinth, he says this, man, I thank God for you guys. Man, I'm thankful for you. You're so gifted. Isn't it interesting how he goes, I'm thankful first. Now let's deal with the issues that you have, that I have to deal with in your church the sin in your church, the problems in your church. But I want you to know that I'm thankful. I remember one time a guy that told a testimony. I read it or told it, or I think he even told it in the church. He got diagnosed with cancer, and he got up and he said to everybody, hey, guys, I want to tell you, greatest thing that ever happened to me was the day I got cancer. And everybody's like, what? Really? And he says, because that's the day I started to appreciate my family. That's the day I started to appreciate every minute of my life that God gives me. And I have found out that I have taken everybody and everything for granted. And I want to be thankful. Sometimes I feel like as pastor, it's my job to get up and command you guys and to command all of us as a family, hey, be thankful. Be thankful for everything that God has given you. I remember a guy was doing a, a men's conference one time, and he was sitting on the plane trying to write down what he would say. And as he's flying to the event, he felt led of God to say a certain thing. And so we got to the men's conference, and there he is, and they introduce him, this wonderful, big, flowery introduction. He gets up, and everybody's standing, oh, and they're going, we love you, are awesome. They're clapping, and they all sit down, and he steps up to the mic, and he goes this. I command you in the authority of Jesus Christ to stop looking at pornography first words out of his mouth. All the men were like, did he just say that? Blew them out of the water. You know what? He felt led of God to say it. And so sometimes I feel like saying the same thing. I command all of us, hey, thank God for your wife. Thank God for your wife. 
You say, well, she drives me crazy. Let me tell you this. The Bible doesn't say anywhere, husbands love your wives unless she drives you crazy. It doesn't say that in the Bible. It says, husbands love your wife, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. It's a sacrificial love. Man, if you love your wife like you're supposed to love your wife, I think you'll be a whole lot less angry at her. Wives, respect your husbands. Be in submission to your husbands. You said, oh, have you looked at a calendar, Pastor? It's a 21st century. I know that is a a sensitive subject, but you know what? I'm sorry it's in the Bible. You know what I've learned in my life? Do what God says to do, and things just kind of work out. (laughs) They just do. You want harmony at home? Do what the Bible says to have harmony in your home. When it comes to husbands and wives and kids, like kids, obey your parents. I said that um, at the Habitat for Humanity. All the families were there and the little kids, and I looked at them, and I said, you want to make your house a home? Obey your parents. Like that. And they were like, Ephesians chapter 6, man. It's in the Bible. You just do it. You be thankful for what you've been given. You be thankful for your home. Be thankful for what you drive. Be thankful for your job. Be thankful for your life. Be thankful for your health. Be thankful for your kids. God, thank you for everything. It's the greatest antidote in the world to taking everybody for granted and being angry and ticked off all the time. 1 Timothy 6.6 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. You say, what's the point? If you change what you value, you are going to what? Change. You're going to change. And I'm going to change. Two things that we value. Two things in 10 minutes. Here we go. First thing that we value is Jesus. We value Jesus Christ. You know why? Because this is his body. This is his church. It doesn't belong to any of us. We get to just be together and hang out together as a church and assemble. That's what a church is. It's a bunch of believers that assemble together and worship him. That's what we're doing. When we get together, we form a church. And this church is his body. And he's the one that's in charge. He's the one that's in control. And so we value the one that's in the control. It doesn't make any sense not to. Everything that we do, we do in the name of Jesus. Because in the name of Jesus, that's where the power is. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have any power, period, end of statement. You take Jesus out of the equation, you don't even exist as a church. It doesn't even make any sense. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the way to the Father. No other name under heaven is given among men whereby we must be saved other than Jesus. Nobody else was born of a virgin. Who else walks around saying, yeah, I'm born of a virgin? Me and Jesus, same thing, craziest thing. Nobody says that. There's only one person that's been born of a virgin. No other religious leader split all of time into B.C. and A.D. No other religious leader loved Barry White and died for Barry White, both me and the singer, right? (laughs) Then Jesus. Jesus Christ is the one that did that. No other religious leader not only knew the way that he would die, but actually when he would die. No other religious leader said that he would die and then rise again from the dead and rise again exactly when he said he would do it. Nobody else has done that. He's the one on this earth that forgave sins. He is the one on this earth that accepted worship. So here's my philosophy. I love him. I love him. So many times I'm motivated to do things because I'm scared to death or I want success, you know. Or I want people's opinions of me to be whatever. You know what? Whatever. Anybody there with me? To just whatever on the whole people opinion thing? I mean, to be honest with you, I can say that, whatever, but still in my heart, I have a desire for people to have a good opinion of me. It's the way it is. But you know what I want to be the motivating factor in my life? And I said it earlier because of the fact that Jesus Christ loves me. I want that to be my motivating factor as to why I do what I do and how I live. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19 says, we love him because he first loved us. That's pretty awesome. And so I want to read God's word about Jesus. I want to be in awe of him. I want to look at how he always lifts up people. I want to see his authority and his courage and his strength and his righteousness and his wisdom. Jesus is awesome. Jesus rocks. He's amazing. 
I love the verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and I just want to read it. It's in the message paraphrase because that makes sense in my brain, okay? The message paraphrase, I love what Paul has to say. In 2 Corinthians 5, 14, before he dives into 14, he says a few simple things. The first thing he says is this. He says, there's coming a day that I'm going to stand before Jesus. It's as real as the nose on your face. Everybody in this room, hey, your life's going to be over, bam, just like this. You may not have it tomorrow, and I'm not trying to freak you out. You're like, chill, relax with that. But it's true. The moment your life ends, you will be standing before Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Wow. And you know what Paul said? Paul said, that's why we're so vigilant, because I'm going to be standing before Jesus. That's why we're trying to get everybody we come in contact with to be ready for the same thing. Then he said, that's why sometimes we appear to be a little bit crazy. That's why sometimes we appear to be a little bit too serious. If we've been too crazy, if we've been serious, it's because we're trying to get everybody ready to stand before Jesus. That's what he said, literally. Then he says this in verse 14. He says, it's Christ's love that has moved us to such extremes. I do this because he loves me. His love has the first and the last word in everything that we do. Our firm decision is to work from this focus center. One man died for everyone. That puts us, everyone in the same boat. He included everyone in his death so that everyone could also be included in his life. A resurrection life a far better life than people ever lived on their own. Because of this decision, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. Boy, we fall into that trap all the time. He says, we don't do that anymore. We tried, it was a dead end, didn't work. We looked at the Messiah that way once. We got it all wrong, as you know. We certainly don't look at him that way anymore. Now we look inside. And what we see is that anyone who is united with the Messiah gets a fresh start, is created new, the old life is gone, a new life begins. Look at it, it's amazing. What did Paul say? The thing that motivates me is the fact that Jesus loves me. It's the motivating factor of my life. Jesus Christ is the only one that has the power to change lives. And so we do everything in his name because there's power in his name. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32 He says, if anyone acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will openly acknowledge that person before my Father in heaven. Does that not give anybody a chill or or make the hair stand up on their arm? It does me. So many times I'm too busy hiding the name of Jesus. You know what? I'm not going to hide the name of Jesus. I'm going to drop the name of Jesus because I want him dropping my name before the Father. Huge verse. If anyone denies me on this earth, I will deny that person before me, my Father in heaven. Remember when the disciples healed the guy that couldn't walk and the the Pharisees and the religious leaders brought him in and started yelling at him and saying, what are you doing in whose name and authority? And they said this, we don't want there to be any misconception at all. Please know this. The reason this guy is walking, because we healed him in the name of Jesus. That's what they told him. They said, we don't want any confusion. So what did they tell them later? Acts 4, 18, in your notes. It says, then they called them in together and they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Look, we don't care what you do. Do whatever you want to do. Do social stuff all day long. Just don't say his name. Don't do what you do in the name of Jesus. Why? Because that's where the power is. And so everything that we do as a church, we do in the name of Jesus because we value Jesus. And that's the only way lives are going to change. Second thing, and this is mega quick, we value commitment. Can I say this really fast? Let me tell you this. The Christian life is a life of commitment. It really is. I don't talk a whole lot about commitment in general population, (laughs) you know, regular services on the weekend. I roll out commitment pretty heavy in 101. But you know what? I'm going to roll it out a little bit today. There is a line of people that are constantly asking you to be committed to things. Well, guess what? I'm getting in line. I'm getting in line. And I'm going to ask you, will you be committed to the church of Jesus Christ? Will you be committed to the greatest work in all the world? The work of the church, the work of God, the work of the kingdom. I think it's a valid question. I want to ask people that. And I want people to be committed. Because this is serious business. This is a family relationship. This is total commitment. Can I throw you another disclaimer? The joke I'm about to tell you is stupid. All right? 
Total disclaimer. You know the, the time when the pig and the chicken were walking down the old country road and they saw the barn and they looked up at the barn. There was a big sign on the barn and it said, ham and egg breakfast tomorrow morning. And the pig looked over at the chicken and said, for you, it's an inconvenience. For me, it's total commitment. <laughs> I don't know if you get that or not, but... You know, I think sometimes we look at the Christian life like it's just a little minor inconvenience. And Jesus says, no, it's total commitment. It wasn't a minor inconvenience for me to go to a cross and take on your sin and die. That wasn't a minor inconvenience. That was total commitment. He wants us to be totally committed. Look at these verses. Romans 12, 1. He says, give your body a living sacrifice. 1 Corinthians 6, 20. You don't belong to yourself. You're bought with a price. Mark chapter 10 and verse 21. Set everything that you have. Sell it all. Give it away to the poor. Follow me. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 38. Take up your cross daily. Follow me. Whoever loses his life will get his life. I'm going to tell you, there's nothing minor about any of those verses. They're all major. It's all total commitment. And so I wanted to ask you as a church, would you value as a family what we value? We value Jesus. We value commitment. And the person that says, you know what? I'm going to be committed. I'm going to spend time together with my Savior. I'm going to spend time. I'm going to be committed to communication with him. And I'm going to get up out of bed in the morning early. And I'm going to get on my knees. And I'm going to open up his word. And I'm going to start reading it and studying it and knowing it and discipling myself. You can't get enough to grow your spiritual life on the weekends here at Park Valley. You've got to spend time in his word on a regular basis. But it takes commitment. I'm going to be committed to assembling together. No, it's not a minor inconvenience. It's something that I'm looking forward to every weekend. And we're going to be there. And I'm going to have my kids in the classes. And I'm going to get my donut. And I'm going to sit down here and soak in the word. And I'm going to roll up my sleeves and start to serve. I'm in. I'm committed. I'm totally in. I'm committed to generosity and to tithing and giving. I'm committed to finding a ministry in the church and knowing my mission in the world. Here, I close with this last thing. Over in Revelation chapter 3, there are basically, or in chapters 2 and 3, there's, there's seven letters to seven churches and you know, Jesus Christ, as commander-in-chief, is kind of doing an inspection, and he's looking at the churches. And the last church he gets to is the church at Laodicea. And he says, basically, to the church at Laodicea, guys, you, 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 you think you have everything. But really, you're naked and blind and poor and destitute. And you really, you really, you think you have it all, but you don't really have anything at all. And then what does he call them? The Bible says that he calls them lukewarm. And he says, because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You know, that's what he says to him, right? The thing that blows me away is if you look at what he's saying in that passage of Scripture, here's what he's saying. He's saying, you have chosen comfort over commitment. You have chosen comfort over Christ. And then the part that blew me away, I was listening to a message on this the other day on a podcast from another pastor out in Seattle, a guy named Mark Driscoll. And he was going through this passage of Scripture and he said something that I had never heard in my life when it came to this passage of Scripture. Never in my life. You see, at the end of that little blurb that he gives to the church at Laodicea, he says this amazing invitation. He says this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anybody will open the door and let me come in, I will come in and eat with you and be with you and live with you and dwell with you. And I paraphrased that. <laughs> Sorry. You're going, I don't remember it. Just saying. So it's amazing what he says. And I always looked at it as, okay, so he's done with the seven letters. Now he goes into the final invitation because in chapter number four, the tribulational period starts, right? The church is um, raptured because it says literally in chapter four that um, John was caught up talking about a rapture. He talks about a trumpet that blasts. He hears this trumpet. The church is now gone in rapture. The tribulational period starts. You don't see a mention of the church at all through the book of Revelation anymore because it's gone. And I thought, well, that's the last invitation. Well, Mark connected it to the church at Laodicea. 
And he said that they had gotten so into comfort and not commitment, so into comfort and not Christ, that Jesus himself, the head of the church, was standing at the church at Laodicea, knocking on the door, and they were looking at him, and they didn't even recognize him. It's like Jesus is outside going, guys, it's Jesus. You know, the head of the church. You know, I own this church. This church is my body. And they're looking at the door going, who is that dude? Man, whatever, just let him stay there. Probably a salesman. Pretend we're not home, <laughs> right? Wow, what an amazing place to get to. I don't ever want to get to that place that not only do we not value Jesus, but we don't even recognize him. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a minute? The most important decision that obviously that you'll ever make in your life is your decision for Jesus. And maybe you're here today. Again, we value Jesus. So every single um, service that we have, we give people an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So if you're here this morning and you've never given your heart to him, you've never believed in him, you've never made that decision to invite Christ into your life, I'm going to give you a chance to do that right now. Why don't you pray something like this? Why don't you pray this? Dear Heavenly Father, I, I want you to know that um, even though I struggle with doubts in my heart, I want you to know that I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I believe that he died on the cross for me and that he rose from the dead for me and that he did it to pay for my sin. And I want you to know that I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry where I failed you. I'm sorry for that. And I pray that you would wash me clean and forgive me. And I pray that you would give me a home in heaven. And I pray that you would change my life. I pray that my values would change as of today. So, Lord, I want to thank you for your love and your mercy in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, thank you for everyone that's here. Help us to be a family because that's what we are. Help us to have each other's backs. Help us to encourage each other. Help us, Lord, to value Jesus, to value commitment, to realize that in this vapor of a life, what's done for Christ will last. Only what's done for Christ will last. Help us, Lord, to, to live for you and serve you, and Lord, to advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.